Hello, and welcome to the People Grow Places podcast, where we explore the virtuous circle of people, growth, and place. Brought to you by Grow Places and hosted by our founder, Tom Larson. Mel, hi. hi. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Good, good. Um, just before we dive into it, I'm going to ask you one question at the top, which we'll come back to at the end. So project yourself forward to 2035. What is the one thing that you would ask us to talk about or to do right now that would make the most impact to, to those people in 10 years' time? So the reason I haven't asked you to answer straight yeah. away is because it's a big question. So maybe just talk, question. pause that and think <laughs> about it as we go. Um, but Mel, you are Sustainability Director here at Arup. Yes. Um, which is obviously a, a huge remit, obviously really needed at this point in time. Um, Maybe you could just elaborate on that a little bit and then also say, well, what does that mean to you? What is a sustainability director? Why is that important? Great. So, um, yeah, as you say, I'm sustainability director specifically for our building engineering practice here in London. We do sustainability in lots of different ways. So we have we have lots of teams and lots of equivalents like me that do slightly different things. Um, but the part that I focus on is all around buildings and, and buildings in London. And the role of me and my team is that we work with our project delivery teams to understand how we can work those designs, how we can work them harder so that we use less materials, less energy, less materials, less waste, and we deliver better social value. So it's all about understanding how we can systemically intervene in design to, to deliver better outcomes. Great. And, and as you say, it's, it's something which is, you no, know, we're in the built environment industry, but it's very much about the humans, isn't it? It's about the people yeah. side of that too. And I think, well, it'd be good to elaborate on that a little bit about how that rounded definition of sustainability for you. Yeah, I think it's, I, I think one of the things that we, we really recognise is that, you know, as designers and engineers and probably actually as humans, we, we really find it much easier to focus on things we can count. Yeah. If you can't, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't control it. And actually one of the, the two really features of sustainability that make it really interesting, but also make it quite hard, is that there's a whole bunch of things that we, we can count, you know, carbon, it's, it's, a, it's really countable. Um, but there's other things that, that are just as important and are much, much more difficult to count. So for example, well-being. You know, we want to design buildings that make people happy because then they'll stay in them forever and, and protest with placards outside if somebody tries to send them down. That's a great building. But it's so much more intangible and so much more subjective. And that's, you know, that leads to the second half of the coin is that, you know, we're often trying to compare an impact against one kind of thing like carbon against a benefit against another kind of thing like well-being. You know, shall we make windows bigger so that people can see out of them and enjoy the place that they're in and connect with their neighbourhood, even though that means that that compromises in, in terms of the operational performance. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. We love things with a yes, no answer and sustainability is often, it depends. And actually that's what's great about it because we're trying to find the right answer for the right situation for the right person. Mm. Yeah, that absolutely. also makes it tricky. Yeah, definitely. And we're all learning, aren't we? Particularly in this space, I think. And the industry is getting smarter and smarter, which is great. And um, if you look around the industry, obviously, a company like Arab, you're very fortunate that you, you have a, a big, you know, a global lens as well as a national and local lens. If you sort of look through those lenses, can, where where are places doing really well? What can what can be learned from from different areas of the world? That's a really great question. I mean, we and we see that not just in the, in the present, but but also in the way that that. that the focus of sustainability has moved over time. You know, one of the things that we really see now is that the UK and London in particular has really begun to grasp the thorny embodied carbon the question and beginning to, you know, we're, we're beginning to understand what it means and, and, and how to measure it robustly and comprehensively. And that's been a really steep learning curve. But we also learn so much, you know, when we, um, uh, when we first entered into COVID, we really, it, it was really it's startling how well the well building certification really addressed things like COVID and, and set in place some really sensible measures that would, you know, help us to manage that kind of threat. Um, and what we understood because we hadn't really asked the right questions was that actually a lot of that was developed in response to some of the, um, uh, the, the SARS, uh, the, the outbreak of SARS in, in in East Asia and that, that actually 
a lot of what we needed to know had been done already in other parts of the world. We just hadn't really recognised its implementation and, and, and quite how, how soon and how quickly we would need yeah. to, get to, to get up to speed on that kind of thing. So that ability to reach out across the world and, and bring in people who've done maybe not the same thing, but a similar thing or, or, or a different thing with, with enough same components really helps us get on top of things really quickly. I really appreciate how, how, how that sort of global span works for us. Yeah. But I also really appreciate that we have, we have a huge diversity even within offices. You know, it's having, having, bringing different experiences to every project because if you have diverse teams, then you get different perspectives. It's, it's, not, it's not something that we tick a box with diversity. It's if we're trying to solve global challenges quickly and having lots of head is, heads is good and having lots of different heads is brilliant. Mm. Sometimes you just get ideas that come out of the box that you just think, I would, if I'd sat here forever, I would never have thought of it from that point of view. I still don't agree with it, but I would never have come at it from there, but maybe there's something in that that we could work with. Yeah. So yeah, I think that not, it's not just the sort of geographical diversity that we have it's it, it's also a sort of diversity of ideas that i really recognize mm. <clears throat> yeah us. no i can i definitely would um test to that you know having worked with you um and it's interesting you know because we did a piece of work didn't we a couple of years ago which was looking from first principles and saying mm. okay well trying to do exactly that trying mm. to sort of forget the rules almost yeah um uh, and think about embodied carbon but also operational from a first principles approach and some of the moves that maybe you can make around the building um, fundamentals to change that. <clears throat> um, so, you know, you talk about grasping the nettle of em embodied carbon. This is obviously something which I think we need to do. Um, and there is an element that we're doing good things in the industry, but it does feel like maybe there's sort of further we can continue to go. Yeah. Whether that's in early concept about fundamentally should we be building what sh types of things should we be building and going through that gateway process to once the decision has been made to do something new or maybe to knock down or to mm. to reinvent then what are the parameters mm. that, that enable the, the best sort of outcomes to happen and all the way down to the to the sort of what materials are we choosing at the, the kind of the back end which is in a way is very important but it's maybe the tail to the dog in some respects in terms of what, what where we can make some of these big improvements so yeah so so do, how do you see that in terms of embodied carbon then what, what are the things that we can do collectively to to really move things on I think that's a really interesting phrase about doing it collectively and I think there are in some ways that tail wagging the dog piece is really important I think there's absolutely things that you know we as project teams can control so things in early concept stage about thinking about massing and form and you know reducing reducing architectural heroics in order to make simpler buildings that require less complexity because complexity basically is linear with embodied carbon so there are absolutely things that we can do at those early stages to get the shapes right mm -hmm. to get grids and spans and those things right there's absolutely it's 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 absolutely not the case that the work is done there yes a lot of the big moves you know you you can you can lose a good a, a, a good outcome there but you can't win it there alone there's absolutely pieces that we need to do all the way along the line with increasing levels of granularity and those are all things that we can control because they sit they sit within the design but i think it's really easy for us to forget that those are things that we do on a project level the bits that i think the tail of the dog that piece around supply chain that's where we have influence and actually that's where the impact potentially is much much greater than a project alone but where we do need to act collectively you know what we know is that that actually from the from the lens that you look through at stage two or even stage three or even stage four of a design the supply chain is really opaque and actually there's a huge potential different differential between getting something out of the supply chain that's really had the work done on it to reduce carbon as much as possible without compromising performance and something that hasn't and and although we have influence over that we don't have control over that so Typically, I think we, you know, we've stepped a little bit away from that and said, well, it's not, you know, it's not a lot we can do about it. But actually, there is a lot we can do about it because people only sell things because we buy them. Yeah. We need to be more consistent about what we're asking for. We need to be clearer about the difference between good and bad. And there's, you know, there's plenty of work to do there. But I, I, I do think there's enormous potential 
for change happening in the supply chain and it does need both halves of the coin to understand each other much better and, and to have much more communication between sort of design and procurement to understand where those opportunities are and to really reward those um, threads of the supply chain that are really sort of stepping up and making a difference. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, I think about sort of what's happening in fashion and, you know, trainers, mm. um, you know, a pair of all birds trainers or something, it will tell you exactly what it's made out of and where the materials have come from and it kind of has that in theory that transparency now obviously there's yeah. a, a lot more goes into a building than a pair of trainers yeah. uh, but that principle of transparency of material passporting mm. um is obviously there that we talk about conceptually but in terms of that delivery is, is starting to come through and hopefully you know that will that will continue um it's but hard though it is hard yeah it's it's I, i'm gonna I'm going to take a COVID example again, yeah. just because we've talked about it a little yeah, bit yeah. already, and sort of cast your mind back to, I don't know, four years ago today, yeah. when we were trying to work out how to get, I don't know, um, face masks, and the government yeah. was trying to get supplies of face masks, and we didn't know where they came from, or what they were made of, and that was a piece of fabric and two bits of string. Yeah. Trying to get an air handling unit, and yeah. acknowledging that we had that little control over traceability over something that simple. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's, easy to look at the sum and think well this is straightforward and actually the reality of understanding how our intertwined global supply chains that have been honed to deliver most ch cheapest price above all else yeah trying to push backwards through those to understand what the carbon implications of each element of it are I, you know it's 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 a it's it's quite a thorny problem yeah it is isn't it and then well, it's funny when you use the example of masks on, on one <laughs> hand it's um not very transparent but then you look at the way that we handled it in this country it was actually very transparent as to where the <laughs> where the, where the yeah. contract had gone um but just back to the to the embodied carbon piece then because you talked about the operational side and, and you know with things like neighbors we are getting mm. smarter but but also with that getting smarter there's also everyone across the industry starting to use some standards yes. and kind of measure things in the same way mm. um with, with regards to the embodied carbon side do you feel like we're getting to that now because <clears throat> it feels like there's a lot of goodwill from consultancies and bodies um to try and at least map these mm. in the design stage obviously we talked about the, the latter stages but it'd be great if we can get to some point where there's kind of everyone's trying to map things in the same way so that the kind of the standards are accurate do you feel like we're we're moving that direction i feel like we're moving really fast yeah yes right. we've got a long way to go and if we make that comparison with operational carbon and think about the you know think about the focus that's been on that element since since the oil crisis in the 1970s you know they've had nigh on 50 years to get this right and um, we've been working on it for you know a few years to get to, to reach the same level of you know the the emergency is is, is focusing on both both elements of those as quickly we've got a lot of catching up to do but a lot of catching up is happening i think we spent a really long time sort of arguing about how to do it perfectly and actually the the, the shift that was made with the release of the first version of bricks was like we just need to do this some really fantastic things like you know policy decisions by the GLA to, to require the collation of data of big projects at, 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 at planning stage will really help build the databases that we absolutely need to understand where the opportunities are so those those two big moves in parallel have really helped you know it's it's absolutely true that you know the better we get at counting in body carbon the more we find and that will continue to be so for a while until until the plateau yeah flattens off that's not a reason not to do it that's a reason to do it there's a there's an awful lot more carbon in in in, in buildings than we you know if we'd known how much there was when we started counting i'm quite glad we didn't otherwise we might not have started um but we're getting better at it we're understanding where the gaps are and particularly we're understanding how little we know at early stages and therefore how much allowance we need to well not quite yet how much allowance but we, we've got a fairer idea of that the amount of allowance we need to build in at early stages is, is substantial. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, as you rightly say, buildings have a huge amount of carbon 
within them. We know that as you know, industry is very high up and globally in terms of the contribution towards um, overall CO2. Um, one thing again that we've talked about in the past is around intensity of use, kind of like mm. utility of buildings. Yes, because yeah, you assume that you know that carbon is spent; it's there, whether it's an existing building or obviously even more importantly if it's a new building. But then there's a okay, well, how is that actually used? What yeah. what bang for your buck are you kind of getting yes. from that? <laughs> how much how much use are you getting back for the investment that you've yes. made? Really, exactly. And um, so so how do you see that? Obviously, uh, particularly important at the moment. You know, you mentioned the pandemic, yeah. and, and you know, it does feel slightly um, a long time ago in some respects, but it probably feels longer ago in terms of how far maybe society shifted in terms of patterns of use of buildings or. I know some of that, you know, there's different opinions on whether some of that's returning to no norms or not, but there is, there is change. So back to kind of usage of buildings throughout the mm. day, throughout the week, different uses. How do you see that to be more sustainable and how we actually use these resources? I think there are, there are real opportunities for us to think, you know, to think about the way that organisations and buildings work together. Because we can make buildings work differently if organisations flex into, into the flex that buildings have. There are some fundamental things that we can build into designs that say, um, okay, given that we know we don't know how people are going to be using buildings in five years' time, let's take that as a, yeah. you know, I think, again, four years ago today, we were probably all scrabbling around trying to work out what Teams meeting was. <laughs> that change happened really quickly. Yeah. If you'd asked us that January, if everybody would be working from home in four months, we wouldn't have would have, we might not have laughed at you because we're, we're not that rude, but we might not have <laughs> expected exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. Um, we can't sit here and say that we can never expect a change like that to happen again or, or a different kind of change. What we can do is understand that exactly as you say, what we need to build into buildings is the, is the flexibility to be able to use them in different ways. And that means thinking about you know, how do we uh, how do we design in security lines, for example, even just sort of simple stuff that says most often we can't use buildings flexibly because we design in security lines that mean, you know, quite soon to the building you're inside or outside. And that makes it really tricky to understand how we can um, use buildings at different times over the weekends and the evenings, how we can flex around so that you could, you know, have a project where you work to Tuesday to Thursday week and then a different organisation had a Monday and a Friday. Those are, those are really difficult to do when we have the, the, the sort of simple parameters around security lines that we have. There's all sorts of other reasons why they're difficult as well. But there's some things that we can really solve if we think differently about how we occupy as organisations and then ask buildings to say, you know, how, how do we need to design this so that we can, so that we can move with the organisational flex that we've got? Yeah. And that, I, I think those, those opportunities to really understand how we can uh, how we can respond to how people now yeah now work but you know there's, there's huge opportunities for us to just complete think completely differently or just think a little bit more broadly than we do at the moment hmm. and do you have any thoughts around you know is, is that happening or could that could that happen i'll kind of give an example that's just come into my head you know if we talk about like a utility score almost as the same as where you've got a got an embodied carbon and you've got mm. an operational carbon i know it kind of factors into the operational because it would be used more intensively but if you were up top of my head if you were to say like a hospital okay that's got mm. obviously really high utility yes it's got really and that utility is also very high social value yes but you know it's going to have a huge operational carbon bill with that but yes. that's okay <laughs> yes um to give you yeah how, how do you see that you know or maybe a sliding scale back from from those types of uses and, and do you think there's anything we can do around kind of becoming smarter around utility of buildings and how that factors into the overall whole of carbon analysis I, yeah I, d I don't know whether we're yet ready to sort of factor it into the analysis i think I think for now we've got so much more work to do <laughs> in, in sort of um, yeah. getting the big number right before we start working out how to split it up. Um, but I, I, I do think there's opportunities, particularly around that social value piece, yeah. for us to talk about if, if we can't make buildings work for us 24-7, 365, who, who can they be made to work for? And it's you know certainly the case that we 
um, uh, reflex around renting rooms to local organisations who for whose values meld with ours very well. And you know, we've we, we've got a great building. We've got all of everything. You know, we've got security and front doors and lights and heat and cooling all the time. There's a couple of local organisations that that we work with that we that it it doesn't cost us very much, really, in sort of in physical terms. It just needed a bit of organisational management for us to be able to say, okay, we can make this work. Here we go. Yeah. It's it. It is hard because it's asking us to do something different. Yeah. But it's not impossible, and it's probably a lot less difficult than some of the engineering challenges that we. You know, we joyfully step up to the <laughs> plate for all the time. Yeah. I think it's I think it's good for us to flex into what behavioural and organisational change means, and actually, we treat those as sort of problems that somebody else does. And actually, maybe we need to step up and do some of those as well. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, it's always it's always comes back to the the human unpredictability yes. of it all, doesn't it? <laughs> so so as you say, this is hard work yes. that's that's happening. You know, yeah. and, you, and everyone. Is, is doing um, so for you personally Mel why why have you chosen this hard work you know for you, why do you feel you've ended up in in this space and, and, and what drives you on a personal level to, to kind of do what you do I, I'm really I'm, I'm really excited by change for the better I think change you know if you're not happy with the way something is you can sit around and moan about it your whole life you can step up and you know say what can I do to make something different happen and I, I think it makes me happy to think, you know, I can't change everything, but there's little bits of it where I think I've got, you know, an opportunity to, to push something in the right direction that will help a whole bunch of other things pushing in the right direction and, and, and bring about the change we want to be. I, 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 yeah, I suppose it isn't any more complicated than that, really. You can lie awake at four o'clock in the morning worrying about the end of the world, or you can think, can I push the end of the world a little bit further away and see if the people come, who come after us can actually solve it with the time that we've, we've won for them? And that's, yeah, it's enough. It's not, it's not any more complicated than that, I think. Mm. And I work with great people all the time. I'm really privileged that, you know, you can have half an idea in a room full of a bunch of great people and somebody will pick it up and mould it into something that will work. That's, I can't underestimate how brilliant that is to work not just sort of internally but you know with external collaborators and clients and project teams you know being part of a mission to solve a problem it does yeah that feels good absolutely and um and is that has that always been something in you you think that that that's kind of driven your actions whether it's career decisions or or broader than that i think i kind of always liked fixing things I think my mum tells a story about Christmas when I must have been, I think I must have been two. We lived in a big rambly old house and it had those old fashioned doorknobs with the square and then two ends. And I think, I think busyness and Christmas was going on and track was lost. And they found me in a corner with all of the spindles and all of the doorknobs, having extracted all of the doorknobs from all of the doors across the whole house. And uh, when I left at eight, home at 18, um, nobody had managed to reconnect all of the spindles and all, the, all of the doorknobs again I think I just liked yeah I think I've always liked working out how things work and seeing if you can make them work better yeah well that's that's a very kind of engineering minded approach isn't it to things it's kind of like trying to trying to sort of um, break things down into components and then kind yeah. of put them all back together again <laughs> yes. and, and see if what you've got is the same or better <laughs> Um, I, I wonder whether your mum would think that the door operated better maybe after you'd had a go at it or not. Funnily enough, she doesn't. Her version of this story isn't as un enlightening and uplifting as my version. <laughs> she just had rattly doors for the next 20 years or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, I don't think she saw it as a sort of enlightening presage of my career path. <laughs> I think she saw it as, why was nobody watching that child? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well, you know what you're going to get wrapped up at the next Christmas anyway, just a few doorknobs. Few doorknobs to play with. <laughs> or a screwdriver. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I do remember working out how screwdrivers worked and just being like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I remember, uh, I remember my granddad, who I don't remember much of because he died when I was quite young, 
and uh, I, rem I realised much later that my main memory of him was how he smelt and what I realised much later was that he smelt of rum rum because <laughs> he was a sailor yeah. <laughs> and I remember him he used to make ships in bottles and I remember him showing me how you made you put the ship in the bottle through the neck uh, but when you pasted it in um, the mast was lying down and facing backwards but it had a little piece of string attached to it so when it was inside the body of the bottle you pulled the string to, lip, to, the, to, to raise the mast up inside the bottle and then he reached in with a little splint of wax and he used the, the blob of hot wax to, to seal the string onto the bowsprit at the front of the boat keeping the keep, and I just remember watching that and thinking that is amazing <laughs> and then he reached in with a knife, really sharp knife and cut the string off so there was no evidence of the magic <laughs> I don't know I just, <coughs> I just like fixing things yeah amazing it's amazing you know you, those kind of memories come back to you isn't it when you kind yeah. of think about these sorts of things and just that um that small moment maybe as you say maybe helped or so do, you, do you feel like you've you've always kind of had that that intuition then to um to, to fix and to be inquisitive so. about those kind of aspects yeah i don't think it was squashed early yeah. enough i think it, and then and then later on, uh, later on, they built the Thames Barrier at the end of my road. Right. So I watched the Thames Barrier going up, which was just such a sort of um, sort of an amazing experience of kind of watching a thing being built by people, and and realizing the sort of impact of you know what you could do by making an invention that that would make people's you know that it's a, it's a, it's a game changer for London. If we didn't have the Thames Barrier, we'd all be waiting around in wellies on exactly quite a lot of the last few weeks <laughs> <laughs> or worse exactly so watching i think watching the idea that you could you could have an idea about how to do something differently and you could make that happen and that the difference would would work i think having that sort of being built at the end of your road in such a sort of a thing that was sort of beautiful but functional and defective i think that can't help I sort of wonder why everyone in my street didn't grow up as an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were all looking the other way or something. <laughs> so yeah, I think it just yeah, I think you have to, I think you sort of have to believe. Yeah. And you have to have, and then once you've believed, you have to have sort of repeated proofs that 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 you can make change for the better happen by doing things that you think about. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so looking forward then, Mel. So, what, what, what do you think we have to kind of believe then, maybe to, to frame that going forwards? I think the thing that I remember every day is that the project teams I work on are really good at doing things, and mostly we get good at doing things by doing it and then doing it again a bit better and then doing it again a bit better. So, mostly when you're asking something somebody to do something of the kind of radical change that we need to make a difference happen. We're really asking people, we're saying, I know you're, doing, you're really good at your job, you're doing something great, you know what you're doing, you can deliver this business as usual really well. I want you to take a risk and do something really different. I think the, the thing I would like us to do is to, not to do that any less, but just to acknowledge that the, 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 the change that we're asking people to make and to acknowledge that that's taking all of the kind of skill and experience that they already have and asking them to do something different even when they know doing it the same would work. Yeah. I think that's a really big ask that we're asking of people. I need them to do it anyway, but I think it's important to respect that. And I think that piece around sort of respecting the, the, the increment of change that we need think that feels like one of the really big keys yeah absolutely and I think something I'm I'm guessing for you Mel is that um, you have a very good ability it seems to to break things down and to focus on the things that you maybe can control or the step by steps mm. as opposed to maybe a sense of overwhelm or anything yeah. around the scale of what's <laughs> happening which is probably if I'm honest more the scale that I tend to go on to and have to bring myself back to okay well what can we do like yeah. now and and as you say, those those incremental moves on a day-to-day -day basis maybe don't feel like very much, but you look back over 
weeks, months, years, and you go, wow, look how far we've come. Uh, yeah. Humans can now build things like the Thames Barrier, for yeah. example. And, and, you know, it's kind of quite remarkable when you think about that. So <clears throat> maybe, Mel, that's quite a nice way, actually, to segue onto this question to wrap up that I asked you at the top, which was, okay, you know, we're in 2035 now. We're, we're sat here again. Um, what's the thing, looking back on, on this period, that you you think we you'd have asked that we do right now I, I, I think my answer would be that we we don't have the luxury to panic it's too much to be done too soon we just have to pragmatically get on with this and not give in to the overwhelm absolutely absolutely and um, just to conclude then what would be for me and maybe for anyone else listening out there who's wondering, okay, well, how do you do that on a day-to-day -day basis then? How do you individually, maybe collectively as an organisation, how do you stay grounded in in the here and now and uh, move forward? Yeah. I, some days I can answer that question and some days I can't. It's it's, it's not easy, what I'm asking. You know, we've, we've, we've got so much to do and so much change to make. I think just making sure that we carry on talking to each other you know, it's great to sit down with you and and and, and have you force me to express myself. <laughs> Actually, that's really important because it can be we can be so busy doing that we forget to articulate ourselves. And actually, if we're trying to bring along along other people with us, then the, the probably the single thing that we need to do is to is to practice being better at being articulate. And yeah stop and sit down and have a conversation about why we're doing what we're doing sometimes yep. and then take that into the conversations that we're having because none of us can do this on our own i think it's everything that we need to do is about breaking us away from that kind of um reductionist perspective of we can take i i on my own can take everything apart i can take all the doorknobs off and i can put them back together again to a wider systemic perspective that says in a circular economy world we have to start thinking more systemically and that means that we have to talk to each other more and we have to break the um the sort of renaissance habit that we have of procuring buildings by breaking all the components down into little parts hiving off all the parts to the cheapest person who can do the job to the brief and then pulling them all back together and expecting miracles to happen yeah we have to think more broadly and that yeah that just means talking to each other mm. yeah absolutely and that that is um one of the key elements of, of being human isn't it and bringing yeah. this back to sort of a societal change which is some of the stuff that we've talked about on this podcast is actually the diff yeah. more difficult stuff to do yes um but it's kind of where we really need the energy isn't it so having these types of conversations is um is really important and i'm really grateful for you giving your time up today for, for having this conversation i've really enjoyed it thank you thank you for asking any questions that made me think <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good that's the least i can try to do <laughs> that is my job after all and, and in, all, in, all, in all seriousness like that's a big part of this for me is yeah. sort of you know it, you need good clients you need good kind of every element of the project team needs to be inquisitive and needs to be kind of asking yeah. good questions to kind of move things on and hopefully this podcast acts in that way for people as well so great appreciate your time thanks tom thanks Mel. thank you for listening to the people grow places podcast for more information visit growplaces.com and follow us at we grow places across all social channels see you next time